Pastor Jason Cooley here with OPBC Online, a ministry of Old Paz Baptist Church in Northfield, Minnesota. And it is 60 degrees here, uh, which in Minnesota is unheard of. I can't believe how warm it was today. I went for a four-mile walk today, and uh, that was my exercise there for the day because it was so beautiful outside. It was like, I got to be outside. It's too nice out here. But I am not here to talk about the weather. I am actually here to talk with Brother Ickes, Pastor David Ickes. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Pastor Ickes is a pastor at Gateway Anabaptist Church in Michigan. Give me the town again, brother. Monroe. Monroe, that's right. Monroe, Michigan. And uh, Brother Ickes and I have known each other, I want to say since 2012. Is that right? Or is it 13? Yeah, I would say that's that's right. I think that's the year that you came over here. Yep, yep. And uh, Brother Ickes got us started uh, in street preaching, and he taught me how to street preach and uh, went there and, and taught us uh, how to how to preach out in the open air and, and uh, witness for the Lord Jesus Christ out there. And what a blessing that's been. And uh, that's been a lot of years ago. And I still have his manual that I still use. And uh, it's been a blessing uh, to us over the years. And, you know, we've had to take that back out and sharpen that up sometimes. And it's good to do. It's good to go over with the crew every once in a while to remind everybody of of our responsibilities as ambassadors of Christ. But today, Brother Ickes, I want to talk to you about a note that you wrote. And you wrote this note um, back in 2009. You wrote this article. Some people would call it an article. Some people would call it a blog today. Brother Ickes, we're so far back, we just call it a, a, a an article or a note or something like that. But uh, uh, they, they have all kinds of different names for these things today here. Uh, but you wrote this on, on Christmas. And, right. you know, the title of this today, really, and the point is the truth about Christmas. And we want to talk about when was Jesus really born? Amen. And tell me, Brother Ickes, why did you write this note? What prompted you to write this? Well, this is something that I had been discussing and practicing for, for quite a long time. Um, the Christmas issue in my life was introduced to my, my life probably 20 years ago. Um, and I have, once I learned the truth about Christmas from the scripture, I haven't celebrated that since. Although I celebrate the birth of Christ, I don't celebrate Christmas. There, there's a distinction. And I think the Christian needs to be aware of what the Bible teaches about it. There's, there's too much ignorance. So over years, of course, people ask me why. Why don't I celebrate Christmas? And I would explain to them, well, I know when he was born, so I'm just going to do it when he was born. Mm-hmm. And they're just so ignorant let me, let me of that. Stop. So, Can I stop you there for a second? Sure. Um, because you have a little different perspective on it than probably even I do. Um, and let me just, I'll share that uh, with, with folks uh, just, just for sake of clarity. Because I think your position is unique compared to what many people have in this argument. A lot of times the argument, and we're going to get into this, is a pagan, you know, the pagan rituals of Christmas and things like that. I'm not going to get too far into that because we're going to talk about that. But, you know, and people just don't celebrate. For instance, I don't celebrate the birth of Christ at any time, really. I mean, I I don't, I, I never... Ever since I came to the truth of understanding about Christmas, I don't. But like you just said, you differentiate that. You said, well, there's, you know, there's a celebration of the birth of Christ and then there's Christmas, which is, which is a unique position because a lot of people that hold the one position are kind of like where I come in, where they don't believe in celebrating. They just stay away from the whole thing. And I believe that's a conscious decision. Right. Um, You know, when it comes to that, you have to come to that conscious decision, you know, uh, of conscientious decision i guess i should say that that you know this is right for me to do i don't violate scripture by doing this and whatever the case may be but you have to come to that 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 place uh, right. yourself and and what we want to do today is kind of help people to see the whole picture and come at it from a little bit different perspective so you go on and continue i just wanted to kind of interject that yeah so so one of the congregants had asked me to put something together on paper for a relative of his. And uh, so I did. So I threw this together really quick there back in 2009. I think I, you know, I I probably spent two hours putting it together, which is not a lot of time, but these were arguments I had been making for 15 years at that point, or a little longer than, well, somewhere around there at that point. Um, And so it was good to get, put it on paper because it just saves time. You can just say, read this note, read this article. Um, and it saves me the, the, the necessity of having to 
re-argue something I've been discussing for years. So, Well, especially when you have the facts in it. See, that's the thing. Right. What, what One thing people are going to realize here during this teaching is, is that you actually have the facts in here. You're not, and it's actually Bible. It's you're Bible. Not, you're, right. you're not going to, ex, you know, you, you don't have to go to extra biblical sources and, you know, you're not trying to prove the paganism argument. Um, right. Not that that's a wrong argument in and of itself to talk about. It's not. Right. But I think with your argument, it's, it's very solid because you're taking the scriptures and you're saying, is it true or is it false? Right. And that's because of what Jesus said uh, in scripture. You know, and John, when he's praying for us, he, he basically is praying to the Lord for his disciples and for those who will learn from them that they be people of the truth. Right. Yeah. So truth is important. It's an important identifier of a Christian is whether they're lined up with truth or not. So that's important. It should be important to every Christian. So I'd heard the, the pagan arguments for a long time, and those, those are, are concerning reasons to stay away from Christmas to begin with. Mm -hmm. But to a lot of people, they just explain that stuff away because it's not pagan now. And, and they can, I can see how people could justify that in their conscience, mm -hmm. that those, those things don't mean anything anymore, and so therefore what's wrong with it? It's not that big of a deal. So... The truth is the, the heart of the matter. It's not, paganism is just like piling on to my argument. It's just extra added reason not to celebrate Christmas. But the, the main reason for not celebrating it is it's not true. And so you're, you're propagating a lie about the truth. I mean, Jesus is the truth. Yep. <laughs> it's, he is called the truth. So how do you think as a Christian you could actually represent the truth with a lie now, since most people don't know that it's not true, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Christians justify the idea because it gives them an opportunity to evangelize and tell other people about Jesus, and Jesus is the reason for the season. You've heard all those slogans. Oh yeah. The problem is, and this is one of the reasons. This is one of the the reasons I investigated this this angle of the truth is when I got plugged into spiritual warfare. And when, when, I, when, I, when I first started realizing, listen, this whole thing about salvation and being a Christian isn't about going to heaven. It's not, it's not about being saved from hell. It's, it's about the sanctification process. But not only that, in Ephesians, it talks about by the church, the manifold wisdom of God is, is understood to the principalities and powers. I think that's chapter 3, verse 10. Amen. So, so the purpose of our salvation in the local church, one of those purposes is to be a display of, to the principalities and powers. Now the principalities and powers do know the truth of when yes. Jesus was born because they witnessed it. You know, they saw it, they were involved in it to some degree. And what a marvel that would have been from that perspective. Amen. You imagine that the angels of God in heaven, and then you have the devils and they're all watching this thing and the, and the, the spiritual warfare. And you see at the time of uh, Jesus' uh, birth, the, the demonic possession and the and the and the demonic the activity of the, the the devilment on earth the scriptures all of a sudden it's talking about devil possession you know you don't read about that much in the old testament at all all of a sudden you have all this devil i mean from genesis chapter six to the birth of christ demonic activity seems to be kind of under control then all of a sudden boom and that's going to happen again when Jesus comes back the second time. Demonic activity is just going to go through the roof. Yeah, the end times. In the exactly. end times, we know right. that uh, the uh, perilous times shall come. It talks mm -hmm. about uh, strong delusion. It talks right. about uh, all of those things in in that in the end times. In that end right. times, when Christ returns, all the the rise of Satan's kingdom. Exactly. So so when when you when you understand that. Okay, that transfers over into your thought process about everything you do. Okay, does this please the Lord? What, what Am I glorifying him in the face of the principalities and powers? Not my neighbors, necessarily, although you want to do that too. But am I making a mockery of the Lord in the face of the devils? Um, so that's why I think the truth is so important to the Lord. Right. The so, Bible yeah, says they that worship him must worship him in, in spirit. spirit and in truth. Right. So how people think they're worshiping the Lord, you know, in a falsehood to me is amazing. And the devils understand that and uh, the angels understand that. And so it's not a very good display of God's wisdom to the principalities and powers for churches and Christians to be involved in something that's, 
that's not true. Amen. So, you know, so I took this idea that the truth is this important, that Jesus prayed for us to, to be people of the truth. Uh, what's to say there? John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Uh, and then, of course, Jesus says in John chapter 8 uh, to about his disciples that they shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Right? So the truth is important. Absolutely. And, and I, what I we think, live for. Right. Absolutely. And that is light. And so in darkness, you're supposed to spread light. So Amen. how, you know, Christians can survive on such ignorance when it comes to Christmas is only because of that ignorance, because so many people are really ignorant of what's going on. And then when you try to introduce the subject to them, it's so difficult because it's such an emotional season. Mm -hmm. There's such sentimental attachment there. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, sure. Because that's, that, that's, that's what I find the crux of the issue. Um, as I get older, I understand a little bit better, I think, and a little more sensitive to those things. Right. That when you're younger. Because it's real. Yeah, it is. It's powerful. And, yeah, it is. And you understand the sentiment of things. For instance, yeah. um, I, I look back and I remember things in my childhood, I remember different things that meant more to me at times than others. And they become things of endearment to you. Mm -hmm. And it's part of who you are. So one of the hardest things is, you know, separating that the, the sentiment, the emotional attachment to the emotional tie to the truth being more important than my emotional tie. And the fact that I can still have emotional ties to other things and have sentiment and family and all that other things, but I, I have to do it according to the scriptures. Absolutely. There's a crucifying of the flesh that takes place there. Correct. You know, and that's paramount. Again, the truth is what's important. And so, you know, and, and understanding that sentimental thing, when you, when you argue things through, through a pagan argument, the, the sentimental and emotional arguments always went out. And it's, it's my prayer, my hope, that the truth argument will be a heavier argument for people to dismiss. Amen. Because cause it's scriptural. When We do know when Jesus was born. Um, and more specifically, we know when he wasn't born. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that tonight. Amen. You know, I'll, I'll throw this out there. You know, it, it's not that because I'm against celebrating Christmas, it's not that I don't have a heart. It's not that I don't care about family it's i mean i have seven children i you know i'm a family person Amen. i'm big on family so it's not that i don't it's not that i'm against giving gifts to one another it's not that i'm against all those things that surround christmas so what no, i have please send me your gifts no, i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah well what i have done is thanksgiving which was yesterday amen we've turned that into for our children that's their when they get older, they're going to have a sentimental attachment to Thanksgiving because that's, that's when we, that's when we exchange gifts and we talk. You know, I I kind of gave them a forty-five minute sermonette after we read uh, Psalm one hundred, which is a yeah. psalm of Thanksgiving, and that. And so, you know, we still it's not like we're party poopers and we just you know we're against fun and we're against it, yeah. that's not it at all. So I want to get that out up front. We're not against people having fun. We're not against family time. We're not, this is not an attack on any of those things. No. This is just a setting emotions aside for a minute. This is just a clinical um, examination of the scriptures regarding his birth and the fact that truth is that important Amen. that we need to line up with it. So once you know the truth, you're going to have to make a move on that or really get numb to to uh, the facts of scripture. Well, what happens is if you... If you... If truth is not does not become more important than anything else, then this is one of many compromises that you'll make in your Christian life or that you may be making in your Christian life. Yes. You know, and but I, I would like to think that most of the time this this is made, this this mistake or this error in judgment is made is due to ignorance. 
Correct. The subject. Yeah. Because I don't think anybody sets out. I want to say, I don't think anybody sets out to practice pagan rituals when they sit around and drink eggnog and sing Christmas right. songs and whatever, you know what I mean? I don't right. think they're doing that and giving gifts and having even a tree and everything. It right. Is, that's not in their mind at all. Yeah, it is pagan. Right. It is a pagan practice, but it's not in their heart. No, it's not in their heart. They're not worshiping that way. And I get it. Me too. Okay. So, um, I, I get that. And I, I don't want you to think that that's why we're doing this show is that, you know, just to, you know, I, I think there's an argument out here and I've, I've preached hard on this for many years, different ways. This is a little unique, different, and that's why I'm doing it because I believe the Lord wants it to be done. Amen? Amen. So, I mean, Anyway, somebody's calling me from Florida. That's weird. Anyway, but uh, uh, this this computer, everybody's calling me. What's going on here today? Um, but you know, I I've done it that way, and I've preached on, and I'll, I'll still continue to preach the truth about those things. But I also think this is weightier in in many right. ways, and that's, that's why we're doing it. So Amen. I want you to get started, brother. I want you to open this up here, and you get started on teach us when. Teach us when Christ was was born. Okay, well, that, that's where we're headed. So we've already established, you know, I've read a couple verses there. There was John 17, John chapter 8, and you see the idea of the truth being important. We see that in John chapter 8, as Jesus continues his discourse there, that um, Satan is the father of lies. Amen. So these things should be important to the Christian. Who am I lining myself up with? Not that your neighbors will know that's what you're lining up with, but God knows. And that's that's unfortunately a perspective that, that most Christians don't take anymore. That's because right. you hear their you hear their argument, well, you know, um, you know, this is all about Jesus. We're trying to tell people about Jesus and 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 that. But the but the point is is that God knows it's not true. So how do you think he thinks? What do you think he thinks? I'll give you an example. Oh, it's top of my head right now. You know, John chapter or Jeremiah chapter ten, which is you know, pretty familiar with people in this argument about the cutting down of trees and decking it with gold and silver and, and, and fastening it with nails and all that there, that it stands upright, which is a description of a Christmas tree. Ask yourself this, whatever that was back then, whatever it meant back then, you can give me all the arguments you want now about what it means to you now, but back then in Jeremiah 10, it's the same thing. They're cutting down trees. They're decking yep. it with gold and silver. And in their 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 in their pagan and idol worship, they use this thing. Right. Okay. So, guess who saw all that? The devils. Mm-hmm. Okay. The angels in heaven witnessed all that 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 Jeremiah was talking about. Now, fast forward a couple three thousand years or so, and the churches are doing the same thing that they watched. The pagans do. Okay. So your neighbor doesn't know that your community doesn't know that, but God knows that. So in that spiritual war, what, what, where, where do you, does that bring in glory to God? That's not bringing glory to God. That's a, that's a slap in the face when the devils are over there rolling around laughing. Like, look at your people. They're doing the same thing. <laughs> Even though they don't mean it, they're still practicing the same thing. Right, and when you that study the, Chris, and you study Chris Mass, you know right. Christ Mass or whatever, right? They're, you're practicing the same thing, as, right? And it's the same devils. It's not like the the this is like ten generations of devils later. No, these are the same devils that were around walking. at Jeremiah at Jeremiah's time are watching Holy Ghost filled, born again Christians performing the same actions as those things that were in affront to God back in Jeremiah's day. So you have to get a perspective of God's position in all this. Is this glorifying God or, or is this just something that makes you happy and you pretend that it's making the Lord happy? Um, and so that's why the truth argument is so important. So what is the truth? Mm-hmm. Okay. When was Jesus born in my, in my note, in my article or whatever, I have a link to a, uh, an article written in Bible.org, which is, a, I guess, a popular website for Christians to go to. And there's an article there on there that supports um, practicing Christmas. And so my note was supposed to be a refutation of that article. And so I link it in my note. So if anybody gets a hold of this note, um, which should be attached to this um, 
this uh, program. Yep. Uh, you go ahead and read it for yourself. I'm not making this up. I'm not setting up straw men. There's, these are real arguments made on a on a popular website. And so I address those arguments in the note that we're discussing right now. And one of those things is that is argued is that we don't really know when Jesus was born, and that that's just not true. If if you read your Bible, you you do know when Jesus was born. It's it, it takes some study. You have to actually look for it. But most people don't look for it because they always thought they knew when he was born because of Christmas. Right. And people have told them over the years, they've told yes. them that this is when Jesus was born. We practice right. December 25th. Right. We, you know, Christmas Eve, December 24th. We do all, this is what we do. This is just what we have right. always done. And it's Christian. And that's what Christians do. They celebrate Christmas and that's just what they were told. So he's born on a right. manger, born in a manger. He was born December right. 25th. That's when he was born. And no one questions that. No I one questions it. Do. I never questioned it. No. Even neither. after I got saved, I never questioned it until someone else brought it to my attention. And I'm like, hmm, I guess that is something I should probably look up. You know, you need to verify it. You need to look well to your going. Yeah, right? what made you really look this up? Uh, my pastor at the time, my new pastor, who's currently my, still my, my pastor here at the at Gateway Anna Baptist Church in Monroe, um, you know, he's the one that taught me this. Uh, he didn't bring up the truth argument, but he's the one that that brought up the idea of Jesus not being born on Christmas. That's the first time I'd ever heard that. And that's so, like heresy when you first hear that. No, oh, it's shocking because it's like, come on, you know, what can be so wrong about Christmas? Again, I will point this out. This is why it's important to have a local church. Mm. Um, another reason why to have a, a local, a good local church, because it's hard to withdraw yourself from the Christmas season if you don't have a local church that also follows that same path. Unity. So you, you, yes. Yeah, so you have you have the comfort and assurance um, and approval of those that you're intimate with as far as in the local church. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're, if you're all by yourself and you're learning this issue and you don't have a local church or worse, you're at a local church that does Christmas, how are you going to pull yourself away with, because what you're surrounded by is going to be totally against what you're doing. It's going to make it tenfold harder to uh, actually move on this issue in the direction of truth. So we can understand that it's hard, I just happened to be blessed to have a church at Amen. that time that uh, taught me the truth. And so I started to investigate it. And by investigating it, well, sure enough, you can find this. This is not hard. The key is to understand when John the Baptist was born. Because okay. we, we, we do know that John the Baptist was, was six months older than Jesus, and they were cousins. Right? You can find that in, in the New Testament there, Luke. And um, So when you find out the timing of of when John the Baptist was born, then you can just do some simple math formulas and boom, you know when Jesus was born. And it makes a, a lot of sense with all the other uh, variable pieces of information around the Christmas story, what they call the Christmas story. It really matches, not December, it, it matches, you know, harvest time, late Are September, or October. Let me stop you here for a second. Sure. And say this. Are you telling me that you actually use the Bible? Yes. It's amazing. You, you use the Bible to prove when Jesus was born. Yes. And 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 why the truth is important. And you use the scriptures for the basis of all of that. Your whole argument is surrounded upon studying the word of God. Amen. That's that's true. And and that if 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 the Bible didn't say or give us any clues um, as to when he was born, then I wouldn't have much of an argument, mm -hmm. right? Because it would be ambiguous. We wouldn't know. And so then how do you convince people that one day is any different than another? You could still make a, an argument that of any time of the year, it would be better to just, if you're going to randomly pick a day, December 25th should be like the last day <laughs> that you should pick simply – Simply, it's the darkest time of the I think, year. Well, I think, I think, uh, I think Tino summed it up one time. I don't think it was Tino that said it. Uh, he said something like, "Like, 
you know, I can understand choosing a day to celebrate somebody's birth, but do you, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like celebrating your wife's birthday on your, uh, on your ex-girlfriend's birthday or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an insult. You yeah, know, it's, like, it's like the worst time of year to, uh, to, uh, just randomly. That's why I don't think it's random. No, it's, I think, I think there's more the to that. Yeah. So when you, when you look at the timing of John the Baptist's birth, well, how do you know when John the Baptist was born? Well, you know who his daddy is, you know who his mama is, mm -hmm. you know, Zechariah and, and uh, Elizabeth. And we know when Zechariah was ministering in the temple, he was ministering according to the course of Abia. That's what the scriptures say. As a matter of fact, I got a link to another site that walks, will, walk, will walk you through all of this because I didn't put it in my note. The note would be just huge if I tried to put all this information in there. Right, try to but put the timeline I, in. Yeah, I, I put a link to that, although I do address the timeline in a, in a, in a concise ma matter, manner in my note. I have a link for a more detailed description of how this all breaks down. But the course of Abiah, if you, if you look at the First Chronicles chapter 24, you find the divisions of the courses. So First Chronicles 24, um, verse number one, you know, we find out that, that King David, he appointed the courses. And um, what is a course? Well, can I, can I stop you just for a second? Yes, you can. Because I just want to say this to you. This, you're, pro you're proving so a side point here that's very important. That there is no bit of this scripture that is, that is not important. Correct. Because you're showing that you found a fact of something written in Chronicles, which is the hardest book in the world, one of the hardest books in the world to read through. All right. I mean, let's just face it. It's not, it's not like you're reading about the plagues. It's not like you're reading about fire coming down from heaven all the time. And I mean, you're reading a lot of chronological information that's important, but there's facts in there that are important. And that's why, you know, that's why like you've, you've taught one thing that I've learned from you, brother, is you said you got to read entire chapters of the Bible, entire books of the Bible, right. got to read those things to learn properly. Right. Because otherwise you take things completely out of context. And I know right. this is a side note, but it's very important to understand that there's a lot you can learn from the book of Chronicles, from these, from these books, things that you don't think that you're going to pick up. This is a very important, um, scripture that prove that that helps you lay the foundation for this entire argument and it's found in chronicles absolutely yeah yeah absolutely there's the genealogies all those boring parts of scripture there there's there's some foundational doctrines that that those portions of scripture lend a lot of weight to so they're not just there you know most people skip those portions of scripture because it you're not learning anything. It's laborious. Not, right. It's, it's like redundant, you know, and then he, you know, you're just kind of just repeating the same things over and over. Well, I don't think God stutters. I think he puts that stuff in there on purpose repetitively. And, and all those things lend credence to the truth of the Bible. As a matter of fact, you know, if you're going to make up a, if, if you're just a man trying to make up a fake religion and trick everybody, you're not going to put a whole lot of intricate details like that in your, in your book, because it'd be too easy to falsify. You're putting too much information in there that would discredit the entire thing. But, uh, but the glory to God, I mean, it verifies everything that you see in reality. Amen. So, so you go, you go to, you go to, go to Chronicles there in chapter 24, you see these courses. Now, what is a course like a, a modern or a contemporary understanding of the word, which fits here. Would you ever heard of like a three or four course meal? Yeah. You, you get one course. And then the next course comes after that. And then another one follows. You don't get all the food at once. You get it in courses. Okay, so these courses are an order of ministration by the priests. So I won't read the whole section, but you read, if you read First Chronicles 24, verses 1 through 19, you read about the courses. And the eighth course, which is in verse number 10, I'm sorry. Yeah, in verse number 10, the seventh to... Uh, Hekos and the eighth to Abiah. So the eighth course, Abiah's family was to minister there um, at the temple. So fast forward into you know the New Testament there, mm -hmm. and we learn about 
Zacharias was ministering the course of Abiah. So he was performing the eighth course um, of the uh, ministration there at, at the uh, temple. So when was that? Well, you, when you read the note or you read the link, you'll find out that each course, there were 24 courses, each course ministered two weeks a year. And the, the weeks were separated. So you'd go through the 24 and then you would repeat the 24. There were also uh, three festivals or feasts that all the families ministered, you know, Pentecost and the atonement, Passover, mm -hmm. where yeah. everyone had to come. All the people of Israel had to come to Jerusalem to the, tab, to the temple to, to fulfill the feasts. Okay, so um, when you take into account that of the beginning of the Hebrew year, being in somewhere like March, April, and Zacharias is uh, performing the eighth course. You don't just go eight weeks into the calendar year because you have Passover and Pentecost in there. So those were two weeks that all the families ministered. So you're really 10 weeks into the year, the Hebrew year, when the eighth course is being performed. Okay, so that would get us to somewhere like mid June. Okay, so when Zacharias is done performing his, his ministry, of course, he gets the, the news that his, his you know, wife Elizabeth is con con going to conceive and, and have a son. And, of course, he's struck dumb. He can't speak. Mm -hmm. And he goes home to Elizabeth. So by the time she conceives, it's not unreasonable to say, okay, late June is when she conceives John the Baptist. Okay, then you, then you get more information about Mary, who is um, a cousin of Elizabeth. And she is given the news that she's going to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus, right? Amen. So she runs to, uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse number 36, she runs to, 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 to pronounce the news to Elizabeth of her conception, of Mary herself, her conception. And this is what Luke one thirty six says. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. Mm, so yeah. we've got some more time element here. We've got another time element. When Mary conceives, Elizabeth is six months pregnant already. Mm -hmm. So if she gets pregnant in late June, six months later, Mary gets pregnant. Well, six months later from late June is late December. So you see, late December is not irrelevant to the discussion, but that's when Jesus was conceived, mm -hmm. not when he was born. Okay. So Jesus is conceived in late December. And then, of course, nine months later, he's born. And that would be late September, uh, early October, right around, guess what? The Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, I don't, it's, it's not too far fetched to say. I actually believe that he was likely born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Makes sense. Um, God tabernacling in the flesh and that kind of thing. Because when he died, he fulfilled all kinds of scripture. You know, unleavened bread and or Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, all that kind of stuff. He fulfilled That's, all the ceremonial law. Exactly. All, feasts, all of those things. Yeah. So, you know. So why do we think Jesus was born in just some random time of the year? You, you know what I mean? And then when you have all these clues right here, which I could have got a little bit more detailed there, but we'd be here for quite a while, and that's why we link to it. But, you know, being born at the Feast of Tabernacles makes all kinds of sense for several reasons. Of course, this was the time of the year that uh, would be the perfect time for a king to tax his people, right? Yeah, you know, so... Yeah. So this is when all the, the year's work is brought into stores, right? It's all harvested. So people have more than any other time of the year at harvest time. Perfect time for, for taxation. We know that is another variable in the equation of the story of Christ's birth, right? So uh, that makes sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me that a king would, would have people travel to their birthplace in winter, especially when you're crossing mountains. To pay taxes. It, right. And it makes zero sense. You know, but late September, early October, not a problem. The you want to make sure they get all the money they can get in. Exactly. And why not tax them when they have the most that they're going to have all year long? Right. 
in the middle of winter. That doesn't make any sense, or at least the beginning of winter. That it just doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. The the shepherds are in the fields. They're not going to be in the fields in late December. How cold is it in in that time period? The the climate. I studied this out too before. The climate is sort of like that of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So it's chilly. Yeah. So it can get cold and it it can snow, especially in the mountains. So, um, you know, they would bring the 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 sheep into sheep coats, barns, and caves and things like that to keep them from the elements but yet when jesus was born the shepherds were in the field that doesn't make much sense in late december but it makes all kinds of sense in late september so when you take all these things that people won't argue about nobody's arguing that the 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 shepherds were in the fields nobody's arguing you know that there was taxation nobody's arguing whether or not uh, people had to travel to their birthplace but it doesn't make any sense that this would occur in the darkest time of the year, you know, the winter solstice, you know, the, the weather's not too good. Um, and you're seven. Not, not to mention even like what goes on with the winter solstice and the spiritually dark. Stuff. Exactly. All and of course, kind of stuff, Jesus is the light of the world, but he's born at the darkest time of the world. Of, of the right. Year. It just makes zero sense. Another thing I guess I could throw in there is, and, and I don't know how I can prove this other than I can say, that every every and it doesn't even matter what denomination you look at it seems like every theologian or scholar or whatever you want to call them nobody argues the timeline of jesus ministry being three and a half years i've never heard anything different than that ever right, right? now i haven't taken the time i'm going to admit right. that front. i haven't taken the time to verify all that but i haven't heard any counter argument to that so i'm well i'm open to hearing to hearing some evidence contrary to that. However, if, if we accept that, right, what would three and a half year ministry be? When when Jesus started his ministry, Luke 3.21 says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Um, so Jesus started his ministry right right around his birthday. Right. Okay, because the baptism begins his ministry. Okay, so he's right about 30 years old. So if if I'm right and uh, that the scriptures are pointing to late September, then Jesus began his mis- ministry in, in, in mid-September um, or the beginning of September. So what what is three and a half years from there? We know when he died. We know yeah. with without any question when Jesus died, and that was Passover. Yes. Right? You're not going to get three and a half years from December. Three years and a half would put you in June. Right. Jesus didn't die in June. No. He died in late March, early April. So it doesn't fit the timeline. The timeline fits the Feast of Tabernacles. So all the variables involved in Scripture concerning the birth of Christ point to what I'm I'm saying here that Jesus could not have been born on December 25th it's just impossible none of the variables match up with it yet all the variables and the timeline which you can work out like I just discussed points to the feast of tabernacles so we do know when Jesus was born now someone might throw out the idea that maybe Zacharias was performing the second course of the course of Abia well, if that's true, then then Jesus would have been born in what March, but that also wouldn't fit the variables that we've already discussed. And his ministry would have had to have been four years long or three years long. Would have had to have been to the year, not the half a year. Yeah, either yeah, way, so. it doesn't fit their timeline of what they use for December twenty fifth. Right, exactly, because they won't even they won't they won't argue about the length of his ministry. But yet, it never dawns on them to put the math together for their own position. They they hold these positions that contradict one another. They don't they don't fit each other, and, but they never examine them because they've always done Christmas again. We're back to what we started with. Nobody examines it. Well, some of us have, and and it's it's clear to us, you know, really without any controversy that Jesus was born around the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen. So a lot of a lot of things. What happens with this argument is it's it's a people just do things out of tradition, so they continue to right. do them out of traditions. Yes, but. They're, but you know, you're, you're in essence teaching your children as well something that's not true. 
exactly you know, that and you know it's just like rome and you know roman catholicism to pervert anything that in the bible just like they pervert the birth of christ mm -hmm. you know so if we're going to stand against those things and be clear about roman catholic doctrine then we also need to stand with the truth absolutely you know when it comes to this for our children's sake because you know what i've seen brother Ickes, is i've seen kids grow up out of fundamental baptist homes or you know fundamental christian homes and what happens is you know they get out of the world and somebody challenges them and they're not able to they're not equipped no they're not and they say well why do you do christmas and it's this and it's that and jesus wasn't born here and they start going through all these facts and the and the the, the young christians like mesmerized and they end up atheists or something you know what i mean i mean right. they end up, right. uh, you know or, uh, or once you once you once they you know because atheists themselves will make the pagan argument about christmas absolutely That's their number one you know argument. what i'm saying so i mean christians are using an atheistic argument to, art, to support christmas right and it's kind of weird because um i addressed that at the end of my note and so i'll leave that point for for when we're about to wrap up but um you know it's just interesting bedfellows here's a here's an interesting point of trivia um uh, George Washington crossed the Delaware River on December 24th, the night of December 24th. Mm -hmm. And he snuck up on the Hessian camp there and won a victory. Now, why were they doing that on Christmas Eve? Because they weren't celebrating Christmas, but the Hessians were. Yes. So <laughs> your, your Baptists... <laughs> You know, they were on the boats crossing the Delaware. They weren't, they were, they didn't care about Christmas. They weren't celebrating no. Christmas. That's a fact. That's a historical fact. They didn't celebrate Christmas in the United States for quite a long right. time. And, uh, and, but yet, the, if, if the Hessians were Lutherans, then the, the, the revolutionary army there, the Continental Army, used Christmas against the Lutherans to win a victory there. <laughs> so, so it, it just, it's not like we're attacking something that has been practiced by our forefathers for 2000 years. It has not. No, this is for Baptists, Anabaptists. Christmas is so new to them that it's 150 it's, years. Absolutely. It's, it's absurd that it ever began. Right. The because tragedy, it started in like 1850 or something uh, like that. Right. Right. Yes. With the whole Charles Dickens thing and you know, the Christmas Carol and, you know, I've done a little bit of study on that, and it's just, you know, I want people to understand that, that, that if, if you're a Baptist or you're an Anabaptist or, or whatever, that it's, it's not like all Christians always celebrated Christmas, and all of a sudden, here we are, you know, because I could see somebody saying, oh, like, God withheld the truth from everybody until you figured it out. No, I'm not saying that at all. That, as a matter of fact, more Christians, more born-again Christians, unorthodox non-protestant non-catholic christians in, in history there's more christians that never celebrated christmas than have so mm -hmm. um we're not we're not in the on the side of of ruining something that's been a solid staple of christianity since <laughs> since the birth of christ we're actually trying to get people back to the faith of their fathers amen and, and and they just don't they don't know that part. They're just it's just no. They're ignorant of the history of this entire movement of of pushing exactly. Christmas, and largely the history of it. Let's just be honest: is commercialized. That's not what this 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 day is about or this teachings about here. But honestly, it was foisted onto people through a commercial sense. I mean, the number one image used for Santa Claus was invented by Coca Cola. So, you know, not that that matters a whole lot, but the point is, and because I know a lot of Christians don't believe in Santa Claus, but celebrate Christmas. I, you know, I'm not trying to get off on a tangent here, but the truth on a side note, that's the truth. That Coca-Cola is the one that invented Santa Claus, that particular Santa Claus that's used. So a lot of it is a commercialization, like you said, with Charles Dickens and all this other, a lot of it is that, you know, and then mm -hmm. people do it for various different reasons. Right. But, but again, truth is our goal. Truth. truth is our goal and when you know the truth and you know when jesus is born you know i have no doubt there's no no question or doubt in my mind when he was born amen um so at that point once you are confronted with that what are you going to do with that as a christian what do you 
going to do with that? I've heard, I've heard Christians say, well, the Bible doesn't, you know, forbid us from celebrating his birth, you know? Yep. Well, I'm not forbidding. I'm not, I'm not arguing the forbiddance of it. Uh, you don't have to celebrate it. Um, and as a matter of fact, I know I said at the outset of the, the discussion here that I celebrate his birth. I, I, I celebrate is probably too strong of a word. I acknowledge it. Right. I, I, I acknowledge it when it happened. We acknowledge it at the local church. We mention it. We might sing some some hymns that are typically sung at Christmas time, but they're telling the story of the birth of Christ in the hymn. And we'll do it around late September, early October. So, I, 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 you know, we've even done an Advent program. Um where the kids act out the parts, the scripture that we just discussed, where we Zacharias and the temple and the, all of that stuff. And, and our kids um, will act out the birth of Christ, and, but it's at the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're not arguing that anybody's forbidden to do it. But I, I think that argument about forbidden is silly because you hear that argument about all kinds of things. Right. You know, where right. does the Bible say I can't do that? And to me, that's just dangerous. Wouldn't it be better to, to ask where in the Bible does it say I should do that? Exactly. <laughs> I was like, you don't do that with your parents. And I, I put a little little illustration in my note about, um, I, I have not, let me give you an example of, of how silly it is. You don't practice this yourself as a parent. You wouldn't allow it with your kids, in other words, what I'm saying. So if your children go out one night while you're sleeping and they dismantle the engine of your car, right, they just tear it apart. And then you wake up and find your car in pieces <laughs> and you ask your children, what, what's going on here? And, 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 and did you guys take my, did you guys destroy my car here? Well, yeah, we did. And, and you're mad at them. And guess what? If the response is, well, you never told us we couldn't dismantle your engine. Does it, does that, does that mean it? Oh, okay. I guess it's okay. No, they should have. Okay I tore your car up and tell me I couldn't. Exactly. See how silly that argument is. You know, if, if, if you're going to make your father happy, maybe you, should at, maybe you should ask him if it's okay to do it. You know, I mean, you, you can't think of everything to tell your children not to do. So they have to be trained to get into the practice of asking if they can do it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. exactly. And, and, and so these people that give us this argument on, on many issues, including the Christmas one, where does the Bible forbid me from doing it? They don't even practice that in their own life as parents no it's not it's not even it's not even in the least bit a part of their train of thought when they're teaching their children in business and whatever you do it's like telling exactly. your boss well you didn't tell me i couldn't exactly and you go out and you do something totally ignorant and ruin something there at the cup for the company you work for it's just crazy <laughs> so we so we do know the truth you know on, on when he was born so I want to kind of get into now, like in my note, I, I, once I lay down that foundation, okay, nobody can say they don't know when he was born and be taken seriously. It, it, if you didn't know when Jesus was born, you do now. Okay. And that's what we established through scripture. You do know when he was born now. It's the, the, the scriptures not, is not, they are not ambiguous concerning when he was born. There's enough information in the Bible to give you uh, a solid idea with confidence of when he was born around the Feast of Tabernacles. And once you know that, okay, I laid that position out in my article, and then I was tasked with addressing this other article on Bible.org. So I had to take this gentleman's arguments and, and, and refute them. And so it's interesting. So now how did you come across this article on Bible.org? Was it thrown in your face by someone? Yes. Well, look, no, it, this is it, this is what was given to me by, by one of the congregants of the church. They gave me this article. Oh, and they asked you to refute it. That's right. Yeah, because they, one of their relatives had given it to, to him. Because this was at the time when he was kind of contemplating this whole Christmas issue because it was new to him. And so he was discussing it with his family. And they threw this article at him. And he didn't know quite how to handle all the arguments in there. And he asked if I could answer the arguments. Well, that's my job. If I'm a pastor, Amen. I've got to be able to to, uh, to to prove myself as a minister by, uh, you know, convincing the gainsayers. That's one of the things that we're supposed to do as pastors. You've got to prove yourself as someone who knows what you're teaching and talking Amen. about. So I took on the task. And so 
I lay out the idea that we don't, the argument that we don't know when he was born, therefore any old random day will do. I, I got rid of that argument at the outset of my note. So then I start getting into the arguments, the other arguments presented in, in the article. Um, where does this guy start off? Got it here in my notes. Um, one of the arguments that okay, what he does is he he's also addressing arguments against Christmas and he's refuting them, and then I'm refuting his refutation of those uh, arguments. So it's kind of a that's why I link the article because I want people to 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 have access to the information that I'm dealing with in case they question what I'm saying. But the the first one that he was confronted with was the idea of the materialistic nature of Christmas. Well, I don't make that argument. I don't even think it's necessary. I think everyone can see through that. It doesn't right. even need a, a refutation. I would agree with them. It became, that's not a reason not to do Christmas as far as I'm concerned. There's so many other reasons for it. That's that's so far down the totem pole. It's not even worth addressing. And then he gives us a, an argument about, um, uh, you know, the pagan roots. So he argues, and so... I, I deal with that a little later because he brings it up again in his article. Um, so he is saying that the paganism shouldn't stop you from celebrating Christmas? Correct. Yes. Because most people, they argue solely from that position. That's like the only argument they have. And they bring out all the, the, the information about Krampus and the Yule logs and the, you know, all that. Well, other I will say stuff. this. Krampus is a little bit scary, okay? I it, it, is. it is. It's kind of creepy. When you look at some of those festivals they have over there in Europe, it is Germany? pretty creepy. I mean, yes. Krampus, listen, listen, <laughs> Krampus scared me half to death. When I seen Krampus, I was like, whoa, dude, like yes. that guy is scary. I mean, if Krampus came after me, I would be running. I would be running as fast as I could. He was a scary dude, man. That's Santa's cousin or whatever it is. But I, you know, his alter ego. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, so, so this, uh, this, this uh, author, he, he, his, his next argument, he's dealing with the idea that the, the absence of scripture authorizing Christmas. And, and I mentioned that already with my kind of a, a illustration about my car, but he says that when you, when you argue against Christmas because the Bible, you know, for the absence of evidence, you become hyper literal. And so my counter argument to that is the truth is never hyper anything. Right. The truth is the truth. It's not too much. You can't have too much truth. It, the truth, truth is that there's, it's, it's like you can't be too much pregnant or too little pregnant. You're pregnant. You can't have too much truth or too little truth. It's true or it's not true. Truth is truth. Okay. Yeah, we're not. One thing, one thing I said, I remember uh, telling our folks here too, is that you're not going to get to heaven and God's not going to say to you, I guarantee you, he's not going to say to any of us. Now, look, you followed me too closely and you, you took me too literally. <laughs> you're right. You know, exactly. that's not going to happen. No, it's not. No, as a matter of fact, I even use that. I, I use that in, in in when I'm teaching bibliology about the King James issue. You know, uh, I can't imagine the Lord saying, "You took my words too literally." That like I actually was going to preserve them when I said I was going to preserve them. Yeah, you actually believe me? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like how dare you believe what I said? Yeah. You know, I I I I didn't really mean it like that. I, I just don't see the Lord doing that. So, um, that's not the Lord I know. Not uh, consistent with his nature. No, and as a matter of fact, I, I find that pretty awesome that Pilate, when Jesus is on trial, he throws out, what is truth? Like, it's relative. And so we're surrounded by a society that's asking the same question. What is truth? Well, I'm not lining up with Pilate. I know that's, what truth is. You know, that's why this is important. Okay, this is... Absolutely. That's, that's why this is so important. Because, Brother Rick, as you and I are on Facebook, social media, we're around lost people in the world. Um, our church members are around lost people in the world right. and we have a world that is calling truth. They either call it postmodernism. Truth is relative. Right. Or the second thing that happens is that people are, are grasping for the truth. They're, they're, they're wanting to hold on and find some fundamental truth that is absolutely rock solid true. And they want their people want the truth. They don't like People don't really like to be lied to. They like to have know that they're following the truth. For the exactly. most part, people, they crave honesty and truth. You know, yes. they really want that. Even if they don't always do that themselves, they, well, that, they don't like being lied to. I'll, I'll follow you on that 
before we go too far off on a tangent, but you know, this is why it is being argued now and taught on college campuses that um, truth is uh, a tactic used by the patriarchy to um, propagate their control. So it's like truth is an evil now. See, they're they're flipping the whole thing. Truth is evil. Mm-hmm. So this this is the this is the environment we're dealing with. And so, listen, as a Christian, you don't have that luxury to pretend like you don't know the truth. Because if you don't know the truth, then you don't know the truth, who's Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the truth is in the scriptures. Thy word is truth, Jesus said. And uh, when you have the truth, you're going to have to line up with it. It's hard to call yourself a Christian and not line up with truth. Now, it's we can have sympathy and compassion upon ignorance because everyone's got a level of ignorance on something oh, yeah, right now. Too. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. Me too. But what I'm not ignorant of is when Jesus was born, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's important to line yourself up with truth. So to keep, to continue on with the, with this guy's thing, it, it's, it's kind of easy to knock down his arguments. There's a couple bigger ones. That That's an easy one where he's talking about that there, but he, he you know, the, he deals with Colossians too. Apparently someone, argued that Colossians 2 somehow was an argument against Christmas, which usually that's uh, part of Scripture is used to justify Christmas. Hmm. Um, But that would only be true if any random old day was good. But it's not, as we already laid out. That's why we laid it out already, when Jesus was born. Another one of his arguments is, uh, is again, that, that paganism argument the roots of christmas christmas are pagan and he 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 cites some encyclopedia and gives which gives a glowing report about how this paganism was kind of um absorbed into christianity right Mm -hmm. like that was a like like it was a good thing and of course that's not a good thing because then what can we go back and talk about this real quick here? Sure. Uh, let ahead. no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a yes. moon or of a Sabbath day, which are the shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Yes. Okay. So that's the, the, Christmas was never designated a holy day. The Bible is talking about a holy day. Right. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting to me how people will use those verses to justify, he said somebody used it to not to justify. To argue them. against Christmas, which is strange to me because. I never heard that. I mean, yeah, I never had either. And I mentioned that in the note. It, I've never heard that argument before. And, and, and he does a good job of explaining what the point of the text is. He's actually right on it. Yeah. And that argument, I'll give him, give him credit there. He's actually right on it. But, but the text has act, absolutely no relevance to what we're talking about because we're actually talking about the truth. You know what I'm saying? We're. We're, we're again that truth argument it is important this isn't any old random day so the text of colossians is just basically saying well if one guy's got a conviction to do something upon one day or whatever you know don't make a big deal of it mm-hmm. but it's not about that people are doing it because they actually think it is the birth of jesus or they actually don't or they actually think we don't know when he was born so right. that would give us that would give us license to just go with the flow do but whatever no, want. As, <laughs> yeah, as, as we already pointed out, we do know the truth. And if you look at the spiritual warfare aspect of this whole thing, it becomes pretty important to line up with the truth so that you um, don't make a mockery out of your, uh, your local church or your, or your own testimony in the face of the principalities and powers. Well, that's just it. I mean, the church, you know, we're, we, like you said, we're the, um, the manifestation, right, of the wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God, right, in the church, right. expressed in the church, it showed. And I mean, we're to manifest God's glory. We're to be that that example to the world of truth. And if we're not following the truth, and if we're practicing error, knowingly knowing that, hey, the Bible says that Jesus was born here through tracing it back, it's being celebrated here. Well, right. we're not celebrating the truth. Exactly. We're not glorying the, in the truth. Right. And the devils know that. And they they know when Jesus and, and they know when Jesus was born. Mm-hmm. And they're wondering why we don't know. Because they know what the, they know the Bible better than you you and I do probably. Oh yeah. They just don't they just don't believe it. Mm-mm. 
So um, that's why it's important as a Christian to line up, you know, with the truth. And so yeah. um, this guy brings out another argument about the, you know, those those pagan roots and how they were absorbed. He quotes some encyclopedia, how they absorbed in Christianity as if that was some, as if that was some good thing, you know, but, but my Bible tells me to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, you're supposed to reprove them, not absorb them into your, you know, into your Christian life. Well, you know, we just since since it's been done for so long, we'll just go ahead and do it anyway and absorb. Right, absorb pagan pagan uh, things. Yeah, can I help you with that? That's what Rome did. That wasn't a yeah. good idea. No, and it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and and so I kind of mock it a little bit here in my note because if you take that logic, if you take that logical argument to its end, it's an absurd end because then that means we could we can absorb absorb anything that's pagan right now and so i i kind of make a a little goofy illustration here to show you how goofy the argument is is you know the the uh, muslim practice of the hajj which where they take their their trip to mecca uh-huh like every 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 muslim is supposed to take one trip to mecca in their lifetime mm -hmm. they're kind of required their pilgrimage to yeah their pilgrimage that's one of the five pillars um of islam so you know i'm like <laughs> well okay well that's a uh, a pagan concept there where you're throwing stones at the devil. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but they got that little black, um, yeah, the black Kaaba stone. Where, yeah, the Kaaba, Kaaba or whatever, yeah. however they pronounce yep. it. Yep. Yeah. So they throw rocks at it and they think they're throwing rocks at the devil and it's all symbolic of that. Well, oh, why don't we just go take a pilgrimage ourselves and we'll call it, um, what did I say here? Resist the devil and he will flee from you festival. You know, we'll, we'll make it Christian. Well, and before you know it, all the Muslims will be Christians because they do the same thing we do. We, we go to, to the Kaaba and we throw rocks at it. We can, it's not logical, we can, is it? We could, we could absorb it into Christianity, right? It's the same thing. This is the same argument. It's ridiculous. Nobody would buy that for a second. Mm -hmm. But yet, that's what they're selling you. Yep. We're celebrating Christmas, that it's okay. We absorbed it into Christianity. No, it doesn't make it Christian. What you actually have going on is the paganization of Christianity, not the Christianization of paganism. It's the opposite. When we compromise, we always lose. Exactly. The, they never lose. You know, the, the devil never loses with that compromise. The, you know, the devil's kingdom, the principalities, the powers, all his kingdom never loses with those. We always give in and give up. Yes. It's right. Like, it's like politics. It's like, you know, Democrats and Republicans, you know, and I don't trust either one of them, but. But the point is this, is that Democrats, they never give anything up. But those that are supposed to be principled and stand on something, they always have to give something up to compromise. Right. They're always having to give up truth and what's right yes. to compromise with evil. Yeah. It's crazy. And then the, the next thing the guy gets into is, and you've heard this, I've heard it, I've heard it already this year. The names of the week are pagan. Right. So, you know, you that, that? that that's easy because... Number one, you're trying to make an argument for a celebration that is voluntary, which is Christmas. Nobody makes you do Christmas. Right. I have no control over the days of the week and what they're called. Okay. So there's no correlation right there, first of all. Second of all, I'm not worshiping those gods just because the name of the week has got their name in it, but yet you're supposedly worshiping Jesus in a pagan way. Those are two different things. They're not the same thing. So the argument, I mean, pagans eat food. So does that mean I can't eat food? I mean, it's silly. This is, the argument is that um, these days, because we accept that, that we can accept Christmas. But yet they're not, they're not the same thing. One is voluntary, one you have no control over. One is in worship of Jesus, and the other isn't in worship of anything. So one is benign, one is malign malignant. It's, right. It's, they're, 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 not, they're not the same thing. So it's all I can do, you know, to not chuckle, you know, and roll my eyes every time I hear that argument. It's totally irrelevant. But he it brings that up. And he, and he brings that up in his, in his case there on the Bible.org piece. Um, and then he talks about the negative connotations of the, the pagan origins. They're gone now. Like, like the idea of of um, all these pagan things like the Christmas tree, all, all those pagan connotations are gone. The Yule log, none of that. It's not really pagan to us anymore. We're not pagans. We're not worshiping. We're not. This is his. This is his argument, right? Uh -huh. 
So he says it's okay because the negative connotations of those of those practices is, is totally gone now. So I, I say, okay, well, that means though that at some point in the past, those negative connotations were there mm-hmm. when they were first incorporated into Christian practice. Those because for the stigma to be removed from those things, they have to be practiced for quite a long time before the stigma is gone. So Basically, he's telling us that everything that's being practiced with the Christmas thing is built upon a bad root because oh, origin- right. originally it had a bad connotation. So according to his argument, it would have been wrong for people to practice Christmas at the beginning when it was practiced. So that's wrong so, now. So, so the foundation's wrong. The whole thing's wrong. Well, so what's his- interesting, too, about that argument is one thing that I like to tell people is, look, I don't think you're a pagan when you practice Christmas. Okay. Exactly. But here's what the Bible says. That's why God says, learn not the way of the heathen. Right. He right. doesn't say that you're a heathen. He's saying, don't learn their ways and don't practice exactly. their way. Exactly. That doesn't mean you're one. It, it's your following. It's like when, when God taught or when Job, Job's wife, when he said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speak. He didn't say she was a fool. He said, you're talking like those fools. That's not who you are. Why are you talking like them? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the argument that his argument there is bogus. He he goes into it pretty deep, but it's pretty easy to, you know, I use a biblical example of the way of the heathen, you know, is the, is when he talks about um, when you pray, you know, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen, you know, because they think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. Well, there are millions of people who claim the name of Christ that practice that right now. Mm-hmm. They pray with vain repetition. Mm-hmm. So does that make it okay now? Nope. When Jesus flat out said, don't do that because the negative connotation is gone because it's accepted by millions and millions of people to take the name of Christ. So I guess that would make it okay but nobody's going to agree with that. Even the author of the other piece is not going to agree with that. But yet that's the argument he's making. If the negative connotation is removed, then it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not. That, that doesn't, that's not a justifying argument not at whatsoever. All. They make, he makes the argument about the evergreen tree, you know, and how it's a symbol of everlasting life and all that other kind of stuff. And I kind of laugh at that argument because they're cutting the tree off at the root and killing it and bringing it into their house and saying it's a sign of everlasting life. It's like, no, you killed it. Now, if you left it out in the, in the field and, and did something, then maybe I could respect it a little bit more, but you, you killed the tree and you're going to hold that up as evidence of everlasting life. It's funny. I did a, <clears throat> I did a study on that, on the, that evergreen tree and pagan worship. And it's pretty intense uh no i believe that yeah it was called you know and not that that's not the premise of our argument today but it's just it's funny because i did a teaching on that and it you can't get around it that god doesn't use worship of trees in his worship at all he doesn't mix that in there um you know with his with his worship you know that's always some that's the way of the heathen that's the way they did it exactly and and again this gets back to the point where like your neighbors aren't thinking anything bad of you for having the Christmas tree, but why do you keep doing that? What does God think about it? That needs to be your first priority. What does the Lord think about it? We well, already know what he thinks about it. Yeah. You already know what he thinks about it. Yeah. He said it in Jeremiah. He exactly. said about it. And so you're basically doing the same things that he already said shouldn't be done. Then he gives a, an argument there about, um, you know, giving gifts and I love this because, where is it? It's over there in Revelation 11. Oh, yeah. yeah Go ahead, read about, that. Let's, let's read that. You know, he, his ahead. argument is that giving gifts to one another is sort of like a, like pointing to the idea that um, of God's gift to the world, which was Jesus. Well, you can say that. But maybe it's also... Um, verse number 10. Uh, can I read that real quick? Yeah, go ahead, because I start at verse 7 through 10. Oh, but yeah. okay, let me, let, me start, let me start with 7. Yeah, uh, start at 7, go ahead and read it. Okay, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, 
where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Right. Wow. So, you know, they're so, they, they kill the two street preachers yeah. at Christmas time. You know, it's no accident. I mean, you'll never convince me that it's an accident that the Mary. word M-E-R-R-Y, Merry Christmas, Merry and gifts to one another are together in the same verse. And, and rejoice. And Yeah, exactly. It's all right there. And it's, that's not an accident. No. You know, so, so you know, you got to be. And beast worship is all in there. And beast worship. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, that's not an accident. It's wow. Another one of those coincidences, I guess. Yeah. But, okay, what else does he go with? He, he talks about, uh, well, that one's a non, that's a non-issue. He talks about um, the spirit. We're, I think I went, might have went past that one, but he talks about, he makes an argument about, um, well, if, as long as you're doing something in the proper spirit and the attitude, um, then it's fine. Yeah. He says, you know, the, the reason, spirit, and attitude, if they're right, then it's okay, right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I break this argument down and pr prove its faultiness? And it's easy. Let's take something that everyone agrees on. Nobody disagrees, or nobody agrees that Jesus was dead for five days. I've never heard anybody ever make that case. No. Okay. So nobody would say that as long, if you celebrated a five-day death, but your attitude and spirit and reason were good, it would be okay. But the facts and, are still against you. It, it, exactly. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Your attitude doesn't matter if it's false. Your spirit doesn't matter if it's false. Your reasons don't matter if it's false. If it's false, it doesn't matter. There are a lot of well-meaning Hindus, Buddhists, all kinds of ists all over the world that do all kinds of things with the right reason, spirit, and attitude behind them. But it's all false. It's not true. So why would we use that as an argument on our behalf? That's crazy. You know, you don't argue like that. Mm -hmm. That's not what a Christian does. He wants to line up with the truth. Amen. So, you know, the, the, the note takes us through those arguments, and they don't have a lot of, a lot of teeth to them. They're easy to, to get, get rid of here. What's another one here? Um, yeah, this one we already addressed. It's the un certainty of the timing of his birth but it, we already know when he was born i dealt with that one already um the wise men and their arrival i don't know why they anybody makes that argument because the, it's jesus is like two years old when they get there so that there's no bearing just because the nativity scene has wise men and it doesn't make it real you know they, they weren't there you know I, the, the wise men were not at the birth of christ no they showed up they showed up two years later um and that's, you can't dispute that. Scripture's clear on that. Um, there is. And, and so, you know, I dismantle all his arguments at that point. So I get back here at the end of my note, and I'm talking about the truth and how the truth will make you free, all those things there. You know, you, and the, my final point that I make in my note is this idea of evangelism, because you hear this argument all the time. How can it be wrong? This is a chance for me to witness to all my neighbors. This is uh, it makes it an opportunity where people are ready to hear about the story of Christmas and Jesus' birth, and it helps me witness to people. Well, I counter that argument with some personal experiences that I've had that prove that this is a faulty argument. And it's the idea that, I, as I said earlier, that atheists um, understand the myth mythological roots of the Christmas season. Um, and there's Wiccans and all kinds of other people that actually think they're upset that Christians stole their, you know, their season, right? Yeah, and Rome so, stole it first. <clears throat> right. They so, took it first, and then they took it over. Exactly. And so, so these people are rolling their eyes at Christians who think they're actually following. This actually hurts your witness. It actually hurts the ability to get these people the gospel because they know that Christians are being hoodwinked by mythology. They know that. As a matter of fact, uh, my the first time that I encountered this, it was a it was a relative of mine who's atheist, and they had this big book on the shelf. I, it was thick, 
and it was it said something like the mythological or Christianity and mythology or the right mythological roots of Christianity and so we got to talking about Christmas and he's like oh man Christmas is nothing but rewrap pay, Christ, Christian Christianity not Christmas Christianity is just all mythological stuff and he starts explaining to me how a lot of the things in the Bible were, were just mythological pagan stuff that was around before um, the Bible was even written and blah 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 and so he gets into the Christmas thing so I, I agree with him I'm like absolutely there's a lot of cr Christians that fall for that mythological stuff yep. but, I'm not, but I'm not one of them and I know when Jesus was born and I explained to him what I've explained on the program already I explained to him that just because you've talked to a bunch of Christians that are ignorant doesn't mean we're all ignorant. Right. And, right. and you're right. And I'm going to give you credit for having your eyes open to the fact that this stuff isn't right. Yep. So I gave him credit. Well, that opened the door. That, that meant a lot to him that I wouldn't bury my head in the sand to the truth of what's really going on that he already understood. And that became a powerful opportunity for me to witness to this guy. Right. Because now I could say, Hey, look, Look, I understand that. That's not what the Bible says. Those people don't know what they're talking about. Yes, they're Christians, but they're ignorant. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to, to to give him the truth. Now he didn't he didn't repent. He didn't get saved or anything like that at that time. But the look on his face and that of others I've had the same conversation with, they just respected me immediately when I admitted that Christmas was bogus because that's what drove them away from Christianity was that these people, all they're doing is practicing mythology. You know, it, it's not real. The whole thing is fake because they lumped in Christianity as just an, a new expression of, of mythology. And then when you take that away from them and say, no, 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 that's not, that's not biblical. Those people are ignorant. Here's the truth. Now they've got that argument's gone. Now they've got no more mythological argument to make about Christianity because you took it from them. Now they're talking to someone who knows their Bible, understands all that stuff about Christmas, and it, it's a powerful opportunity to witness to people when you tell the truth. You can, you're not going to get a lot of, uh, you're not going to win a lot of friends and influence Christians, but non-Christians, who are the ones you're supposed to be evangelizing, those are the ones that you gain a lot of respect with when you deal with the truth of this issue and not bury your head in the sand and join hands with this Christmas thing. And that's so true because I've watched that. I've seen that people will respect you so much more when they're, when you look at them and like, Hey, look, I already know. It's, it's like when you talk about the new world order or something like that, how a lot of Christians don't know anything about that. And right. when lost people hear you tell the truth about that, or they hear you tell the truth about Christmas and the truth about these other things that have nothing to do with the Bible or right. wrong stances that Christians hold. Right. You know, and you tell the truth about it, their eyes open like, whoa, okay, well, I'm not dealing with a dummy now. He's actually, right. And then you start explaining the Bible to them, like, wait, listen, I don't believe exactly. that. I'll show you what I do believe. Exactly. It so, so, wakes them up. Yes. And it, it helps them understand that you're awake. Mm -hmm. Right. You're you're not asleep on the issue. So basically what I'm saying is your witness is stronger. Correct. That's what I'm saying. So this idea that you that you have a powerful opportunity to witness to people in justifying Christmas, it's the, act, it's the absolute opposite. All you're doing is you're living in a bubble of people that already agree with you. With people that aren't Christians and don't know anything about that stuff, they do know about myth, the mythology of it all. And you're actually hurting the testimony of Christ by playing along with Christmas in the first place. So arguing that you have an opportunity to evangelize to justify Christmas, I can argue that I have a better opportunity of evangelism by telling the truth than you do by lying to people. Amen. So, and that's how I finished the note, basically. Um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that's why the truth argument is the argument you want to make. All that other stuff, like the paganism and the evergreen tree and all that other kind of stuff, that, that stuff's all corroborating evidence. But I think the truth argument is the most powerful one because because now you're really putting people on the spot. You're telling them straight up. When Jesus said in John chapter four, and what, what's he, how does he say that exactly here? He says, "But the hour, the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father 
seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so the fact that, that that text there, John 4, verse 23 and 24, talks about the true worshipers, right? That means, by implication, there are false worshipers. Yes. And the true worshipers are who the Lord is looking for. And how do they worship? They worship the truth. Okay? This is why the truth argument, you can whether you can navigate yourself through the whole paganism thing and try to justify Christmas, then bravo, hooray, you navigated yourself through some of those arguments and convinced yourself it's okay. You will never be able to get around the truth, though. You can't get around it. It's not true. He wasn't born then. The Lord cares whether you're lined up with the truth or not, even if your neighbors don't care, even if your pastor doesn't care, even if your community doesn't care. The Lord cares. You're supposed to be a testimony to the principalities and powers, along with your local church. It's supposed to be a testimony of his glory and his power and what he's done in your life and lining you up with the truth. And instead, at least once a year, you're arguing about lining yourself up with something that is not true, no matter how well-intentioned it is, no matter how sentimental the feelings are around that time of the year, none of that matters. What matters is, are you lined up with the truth or not? And that becomes powerful in the spiritual battle, Amen. in spiritual Amen. warfare. You have to tell the truth. And that's that's where our integrity that. lies. <clears throat> Bible talks about integrity, and Paul talked about how he stood on his integrity. Yes. You know? His ministry was was part of the way he proved his ministry in Second Corinthians chapter six. He said was was by his pureness, by by his integrity, by the fact that you know what the truth mattered to him. It was important to him. And the Bible says, "Cursed is he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully." Yeah, I've got that in the note too. Yeah. So they they, they think they're witnessing for Jesus, but you, how do you suppose to do that by lying to people? Yeah, you don't, and, and you lose credibility with people. You lose it, and and man, that's the last. In this day and age, when everybody hates God even more than they ever have, and right. we're, we're in a time of where churches are being completely scrutinized, and the truth is, you got the zeitgeist and all these other lies out there, and all this other stuff going on. There's got to be some people that stand up and say, "This is the truth, and I'm going to stick with the truth." Absolutely, and why, you know. It discredits you as a source of truth on any subject. They won't trust you. When people find you backpedaling on something that they know isn't true that you're defending. And when they see you defending that, and then they come out and prove to you, like I believe we've done today, mm -hmm. that it's not true. Someone who's not a Christian that confronts you with this, what are you gonna, how are you going to talk to them about anything later on? If you're already wrong on this one, how do they know you're right on the virgin birth? How do they know you're right on his resurrection? How do they know you're right on, on salvation? How do they know you're right on angelology? How do they know you're right on anything? Because you've already discredited your own testimony when mm -hmm. you've stood up for something that's not true and the other person knows it's not true. And so it's just dangerous. You know, it's dangerous no matter how hard it is. It's It's not you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous. It's really not a good thing for a Christian to be lined up with things that aren't true. No, because you want people to be able to go to you and be like, I trust this man. He follows the Bible. He believes it. Or this lady, she believes it. You know, my mom, whoever it is, you know, they, she believes it. You know, our family, we hold the scriptures. If this is what the Bible says, if this is what the Bible teaches, That's we right. follow it. And we want to be known as those people of the way, you know. We want right. to be known as those people that, hey, they, they believe the truth, man. They, they live by that book. They don't just Amen. live by it when it's comfortable and everybody likes it, but they live by it when people don't like it. And That's when, right. It's, if it separates you from 75 to 85% of professing Christians out there, maybe 90% of professing Christians out there, when you get this one right and you say, you know what? That's true, but you know, I've got to follow the word of God. I understand, but I'm going to follow the Bible here. This is what it says. Then people are, it, it, your word means something to them. You know? Amen. So that's important. I appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to add to this, brother, brother Ickes, or do you think you got it nailed down as far no, as I think we, I think we got it nailed down and then the, then the resources are there um, in the links that I provide yep. um, for people that want to dive a little deeper. If they don't just want to take my word for it. Cause I'm, I don't want anybody to take my word for anything. Check the stuff out. You know, the, the scripture's there, the scripture's there to support what I'm saying. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that uh, you'd be blessed 
when you line up with the truth. I've been blessed. I mean, it was hard the first few years, but I've gotten over it. I, I don't miss it anymore. I'm not bothered by it, but people struggle with it and I can have sympathy on that. Me and too. I pray that, I pray that uh, you have a good support group, local church. You know, if you're struggling with this, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's hard. And, uh, you know, find other people that can, can support you in, in your decision to line up with the truth. It's not easy, but following the Lord has never been easy. It's a cross. Oh, wow. Got to pick it up and bear it. That's right. It's never been easy and it never will be. So it's, it's part of denying our flesh, taking up our cross and following Christ. Amen, brother. And, uh, amen. Well, listen, brother, Ickes, I appreciate your time. And uh, I look forward to more of these shows in the future as we, we look through different things. And you've written quite a few notes and things like that that I really want to talk about because I think they're very okay. profitable. And I appreciate uh, you giving us your time here uh, in your busy schedule and everything like that. So uh, look forward to, to meeting with you again, maybe even next month. Sure. I look forward to it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, for Brother David Ickes, pastor at Gateway Anna Baptist Church, this is Pastor Jason Cooley, OPBC Online, a ministry of Old Paz Baptist Church in Northfield, Minnesota.